All right, so today I want to talk about um, you know, why historically progressives and liberals have failed to protect minorities. And this isn't something that's an abstract question for me. Uh, in the United States, I am an immigrant and a minority as well. And, and so this is something that, that is you know, close to my heart. And so one, one of the things that, you know, sort of, in, in fact, just to, to follow up on that, I, I've, I've actually never been a registered Republican. Uh, the Republicans represent the uh, conservative branch uh, of the political uh, scene in the United States. The Democrats represent the so-called liberal branch um, of, of the uh, political side in the United States, although in, in, in practice, uh, both tend to uh, pander to the same vested interests. But for purposes of political advertising, uh, that is the shorthand way of, of, of you know, referring to the liberals and the, and the conservatives within the United States. And I've never been a registered Republican. Um, I used to be a registered Democrat when I was younger. Um, in California, uh, when they allowed you to uh, declare as an independent, which would be decline to state on your ballot, uh, I, I immediately switched to the decline to state option. And so ultimately, I'm independent in, in terms of, of politics as much as I possibly can be. And so ultimately, what, what I think that, you know, I think the problem has been with progressives um, over the last hundred or so years has been that the whole world economy now runs on military spending. And we, we hear about this, you know, when, when people talk about the military industrial complex, but it's much more complicated than that. Um, ultimately, even a country like Singapore, I'm, I'm in Singapore today, um, and you know, the Singapore is one of the most successful countries uh, with one of the most successful political um, parties in the history of mankind. Um, the founder of the country may be the greatest politician who's ever lived uh, in terms of just integrity and in terms of being able to being able to bring a nation together. Um, and when the Singapore when Singapore was admitted to the, to the United Nations in the 1960s, uh, a, what happened was the in the speech, the one of the members of the PAP, which is the political party here, that's the, the de facto one party uh, state that's been in power the entire time. What uh, was said, you know, to the to the UN was, uh, you know, we seek to be a welfare state, not a warfare state. So Singapore at that time uh, was on its own for the most part. The um, British troops would be leaving in, uh, right around 1971, uh, and it was pretty much, you know, in a situation where it had to fear uh, for it, 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 its future was not set in stone, and and, and certainly was not um, guaranteed success. And yet, it is now the one of the most successful countries in the world. And and today, despite that statement to the to the UN, uh, Singapore is number one, you know, the highest item in the budget. Uh, is military spending. And furthermore, despite having no ostensible enemies, um, and, and ultimately it doesn't get along with one of its neighbors, Malaysia, but that's not because of a of military conflict. That's because uh, you know when, when the country became independent in the 1960s, the, the, they negotiated a very, very long-term deal uh, so that Singapore you know, would have access to Malaysian water. And ultimately, that deal uh, is, is today perceived by the Malaysian government as being unfair to Malaysia. Um, but, you know, despite all of this, you know, all these issues, uh, Singapore continues to have a mandatory military draft for men. So you have this country that's a tiny country with almost with pretty much no enemies um, and that has become the most successful small country in the world, other than Luxembourg and maybe, maybe Monaco. Um, and it is essentially a... a, a you know, military state, at least when you look at the spending. And the only way this can happen, where you have one of the biggest countries in the world, um, you know, the United States, uh, you know, also running on military spending, all the way down to one of the smallest countries in the world running on military spending, is if you have a society that is able to uh, to ignore international, not ignore, but that, that, that is able to minimize uh, diplomacy. In other words, if diplomacy was working, mil military spending would be going down. But in fact, it's gone up every single year uh, over the last, you know, since the 1960s. Um, and, and it may have gone down in 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. But again, uh, in terms of a percentage of budget, it doesn't matter where you go in the world. Uh, almost every country uh, prioritizes defense spending first.
uh, and then everything else. And so how did we get here? Um, ultimately, one of the reasons is just a, a you know, the, the international community, uh, especially international lawyers, have failed. And we know this not only because of the illegal invasion of Iraq um, under one of the United States presidents, um, but a whole, you know, a lot of other issues, one of them being the Russian annexation of Crimea, um, you know, all, you know, all, all the way, there's, there's so many issues, we, we don't really have to, we don't have time to list all of them now. Um, ultimately, what, what we have here is a situation where internet diplomacy has failed, and as a result, uh, nobody is even speaking of nuclear disarmament, uh, which is what the the diplomatic efforts were focused on in you know after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1990 and 1991. And today, as you can see, that the, even that effort has failed uh, because at this point people do not trust international institutions to resolve disputes peacefully. And so, how did we get here? Well, one of the things you can talk about it is just the fact that in order to have a, a system worldwide that runs on military spending, ever increasing military spending, uh, you have to have a similar system in place that justifies uh, that fear. So you have to have a fear-based economic system. And in order to have a fear-based economic system, you have to dehumanize a group at a certain point in time in order to justify continued funding. So a country like, and this is really interesting because a country like Singapore, again, has no enemies. Uh, how, how does it justify uh, its military spending? And ultimately, as of today, it's able, it's able to do so uh, simply because it is quite possibly the most successful small country in the world. But with respect to you know, an overall situation, Singapore also uh, you know, has a great respect for international law. In fact, Singaporean diplomats were responsible for um, creating peace in the Baltic e region uh, post-1991. Uh, where the Soviets, you know, and the Baltic states uh, agreed to negotiate a peaceful, peaceful settlement um, of a lot of, you know, that resolved a lot of outstanding issues, including uh, relocation of, of Soviet-speaking peoples within uh, the Baltic nations of Lithuania, Latvia, um, and so on, and Estonia. And it was Singapore that was was actually responsible in large part for that. And so you have a country, you know, that that is, you know, again. You know, that believes in, in in the international order, and yet has a ex extremely extremely large percentage of, of its budget uh, geared towards military spending, along with the military draft. So, when we look at this, you know, we have to go back and we have to understand that, you know, we have a situation where the war in Iraq is not an you know was the invasion was not an isolated incident. Prior to that, the country was under sanctions by the United States, which eventually invaded. And in an interview in, in, in the 1990s, maybe I think 1996 or 1998, uh, you had a situation where the Secretary of State was asked uh, about these sanctions. And, you know, th th it was alleged that about half a million children had died in Iraq uh, because of, of U.S.-led sanctions, imposed sanctions. And the, the you know, question really that was asked was, was it, is it worth it? And a liberal immigrant, that at the time it was Madeleine Albright, who was the Secretary of State, uh, who has worked primarily under democratic Democrat institutions, uh, as opposed to Republican institutions within the United States, answered, "We think the price has been worth it." And so you you ultimately have a situation where uh, this was something that was it was it was an answer that should have never been given, and yet there it was. And you can actually draw a connection between the invasion of uh, the illegal invasion of Iraq later on uh, with this, dehumaniz this dehumanization process that has taken place, and that, all, that always takes place before people go to war. Um, and you can look at that as a breakdown in diplomacy and a breakdown in, in the international order. Uh, and ultimately, what, what happens is, you know, what, what's happened as a result of all of this is that the the groups tends to change over time. Uh, what, you know, because again, if you have a fear-based economy, what ends up happening is that you know you have to justify the spending somehow. So you always have to have an enemy. Uh, and you know what, what's what's interesting is that Singapore is responsible to all this. Is that we're a small country, so we because we're a small country, we have to be uh, a poisonous shrimp is is what, is what they call themselves. Uh, big fish eat little fish, little fish eat shrimp. Um, and so you know if 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 you have to be you know if you have to be uh, 
in that position of being a shrimp, uh, you make sure you're a poisonous one. And, you know, again, in Singapore's case, th this is one of the most successful countries, one of the most affluent countries in the world, but it also happens to be one of the most unequal countries in the world economically and financially. And its Gini coefficient, GI and I, is worse than, than the United States in terms of uh, having in, you know, wealth equality, it's at the very bottom, very just like the United States. And I do not think this is a coincidence. These, these, all these things go together. And it's particularly interesting in, Singapore, interesting in Singapore's case because with the United States, you can argue that slavery uh, makes it harder to have a Gini coefficient that's on, on par with the Europeans or some other country that hasn't had, uh, or, or Middle Eastern countries that haven't had, you know, sort of this, this peculiar institution uh, for as long as the United States and, and the Western Hemisphere allowed it to happen. And so what I'm trying to argue is that this is not, these, all, none of these things, the, the dehumanization um, process along with the military spending, along with the inequality, all these, none of these are isolated situations or isolate, isolated factors. They're all connected with each other because this fear-based economy creates a, a situation where you have to produce an enemy, no matter where you are. Now, this this ultimately means that the entire system has failed, but we don't it doesn't feel that way because if every institution within your within your society fails, it actually does not. It, it tends to, to to sort of smooth you know smooth itself over in the end because if everyone fails and the government throws money at everyone, uh, you know, in sight, it doesn't feel like the, the, you know people are failing. It feels like you're trying to fix a problem. But of course, the problem never gets fixed because the whole idea is that if every institution, the lawyers, the diplomats, everyone's failed uh, or failing, and you throw money at the problem, none of the fundamental issues get fixed. And so the problems continue. Um, and, you know, again, you still have this situation where spending goes up every year. And, you know, ultimately, you're, in a, you're back to square one. And this is actually something that's happening now where the nationalism that we're seeing today in 2020 is similar to the nationalism that we saw in the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, you know, so, so we, we keep going back and forth. Now, what, what's, what's interesting is, is simply this, this idea that you know, why haven't the, the liberals been able to or, or the progressives been able to stop this from happening, stop this from repeating itself? And one of the answers is, is this increase, this constant increase in military spending all over the world which is tied to the world economy. And no matter where you are, no matter whether you're small or big, no matter where you are, the, world's, the world economy runs on military spending. And this has consequences for local institutions like the police. And so when you have a, a country where with so much military spending, in many cases, you, you also have a situation where there's trickle down to the police departments, not just maybe perhaps in culture, maybe in equipment, and so on. And this is problematic because police departments have are, are there. They exist in order to protect the local community under this under the basis that, you know, police officers are local. They understand their communities. They're supposed to be able to walk in them sometimes or sometimes, you know, obviously by car, but sometimes in some cities by horseback um, and, and ultimately be able to um, see who was there, who belongs there, and become a, become a, a an institution within that community that protects and is, is beholding to the local people within that community. And again, budgets reflect all this. If you go to any, almost any city in the in the U.S., the local budget uh, is is at least fifty percent uh, tied to spending for public safety, which includes firefighters and police. Um, and and so ultimately, we've decided as a country. Uh, in, in, at least within the U.S., that it's worth it to spend half of your local budget on the on public safety, and the reason that we've decided this is, is you know, not only in part because of this trickle down culture that comes from having a lot of military spending, but also because you can't have a stable society without a stable security force that is beholden to the local community, and you can you know sort of figure this out now. But what ha ends up happening is that because that percentage of the budget is so high, in years when tax no tax revenues or capital gains, you know, or revenues in general just went down on the local level, the first place to be cut would be the police departments. Um, you know, that's because that's where the money was going. That's where the, that's where the money was, and, and and especially because you know about 20, 30 years ago, 
a police officer who retired with would oftentimes receive 90% of his or, his or her salary as a pension for the rest of his life or her life. Um, and so ultimately, this is quite expensive because you're essentially paying for two people whenever you hire a police officer. You're paying for the person during the time that they're an active police officer and then afterwards as well. If it's a 90%, it's almost close to having 100% um, you know, sort, of, sort of expenditure. And so ultimately, what's happened over time, though, is that the crime, of crime rates and, and violent crime has gone down. From 1991, it's gone, it's gone down. And so what, what's, you know, so the police will tell you that if you talk to a police officer, they'll tell you that, you know, listen, if we, the better we do our job, the less the public thinks they need us. And, you know, so ultimately, if the, if the budget is cut or not increased, um, you know, in other words, if the budget is only maintained as population increases locally, it's similar to a cut in some cases uh, because it's not keeping up with the needs of the local population. And so if that happens, uh, what, what ends up happening is that over time, you know, the budget fluctuates and you know, people, again, are convinced to increase or decrease based on fear which is the same thing that's running national politics and international politics. So you go back to this idea that the whole, the entire economic structure, which is tied to the political structure, is running on fear. And with, with respect to the, the police, you, know, you have a situation where, just like the military, you, you have to dehumanize certain groups in order to justify this spending. And then the police are in a, are in a unique position because unlike... The military, they don't have a blank check. Um, you know, budgets have to balance on local levels. So uh, in the past, that was something where you really, you know, you had to cut the budget or you had to increase taxes. And that's what and voters notice when budgets are cut or employees notice when they're cut um, in, or when services are slowed down or, of course, when taxes go up. And in, in recent years, that dynamic has changed. It's become less accountable and less noticeable, notice, noticeable to voting populations because money has become cheap. Uh, you know, right now, if, if you're a, a, a local a city or a county, you can issue a bond um, and, you know, at 1%, and you would have a, you'll have a lot of buyers of that debt, of that municipal debt, uh, simply because, you know, the idea that cities, that a city would go bankrupt um, if it's charging, able to charge a 7% tax while paying out a local city sales tax of 7%, while paying out, you know, one percent interest on, on a debt, that's that's almost extremely unlikely that the city or the county would not be able to pay for that bond, uh, especially if it's only a ten-year bond or a fifteen-year bond. So, you have a situation where, you know, in the in the past, you had to increase taxes. Typically, if you wanted to increase the scope of the police department and the police services, uh, but now you can just issue debt. So, a lot of this conversation, you know, you have to look at it in terms of what what happened you know, of a normal situation where. Um, you know, before debt became so cheap, uh, the fact of the matter was that police officers were paid by local, uh, you know, local revenues, local taxes. They were beholden to the local communities. That's where they came from. That's who their constituency was. It was not the national government. And this is extremely important to, you know, and we'll come back to this. Um, ultimately, so one of the issues with the fact that, you know, the statement I just made before from the police perspective which is we do a good job. People don't think they don't need us as much anymore. Our budgets get cut. Well, the fact of the matter is, you know, we can, you know, respond to that. We we know that's not actually that dynamic. That that that, that crime and police funding are inherently related is not true. We know that because it's you know policing is one factor within the public safety debate, and we know that simply by asking a simple question: Would you rather live in a community that had um, that has subsidized housing um, and has a 0% unemployment rate and, you know, 0.1% of the population were police officers? Or would you rather live in a, in a city that has a 10 to 15% unemployment rate, um, you know, uh, no subsidized housing and a 50% a population of police officers? Five zero. You can fluctuate it as much as you want. 15%, 20%, whatever. And most of us would, would pick the former. And that in and of itself, and, and by the way, to, to make it you know, even more fair, we'll, we'll argue that all the police officers in the second city are honest, 100%. All of them have integrity, all of them, 
And you still, even under that unrealistic scenario, you would still pick the first one, first situation, and not the second scenario. So we know that police budgets, um, you know, and, and police presence um, does not necessarily is not necessarily the primary factor in public safety. That it's really a host of this whole ecosystem that comes together that promotes community community relations. Um, you have the lawyers, you have the judges, you have a lot of you know the, the prisons and the, and the jails. All these things go together to create the perception of fairness, integrity, and so on. Um, and so ultimately, what is what has happened is that in order for these police budgets to keep going, you know, to keep maintaining at uh, such, such a high percentage, the public has accepted the dehumanization of various groups. When I was growing up, that the targeted group was clearly African Americans. Uh, whenever you turned on the news or read a newspaper, it was always this idea, uh, this debate between liberals and conservatives about why the crime rate was so much higher within the African American population. And, and I, I haven't done the math, I don't know if that's true. Um, it's certainly true that the prison population is disproportionately African American. That's absolutely true. Um, there are books like the, the, the New Jim Crow that explain that this is a consequence directly uh, of racist uh, behavior or racist culture. I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that. The other thing the police officers will tell you um, is that, you know, when we start out, uh, we're not racist, but we become racist over time. In other words, when we're exposed to parts of the neighborhood that you, the, the local pres- you know, resident, does not, uh, does not go to, um, you know, and, and, you know, given the history of segregation within the United States, um, you know, most people only go to one small area of their entire city. Um, and ultimately, the police officer, one of the reasons that they um, that they are, in, in many cases, more knowledgeable than the average person, is that they end locally, is that they end up going all over that city uh, in a car, on horseback, or by walking. And so, ultimately, you have a situation where, when I was growing up, that was the case where African Americans were t- singled out um, as a quote unquote problematic group. This has happened on local and national levels. Um, you had uh, all sorts of abuses happening with, you know, all over the all over the country um, because of this perception. Um, and you know, the group changed. Uh, and one of the things I see now is that it, it, it was that way simply because African Americans were gaining political pa- political power, and so they were targeted as a group because they were gaining political power. The same thing, and I know this now because I got older, the second group that was targeted was Mexicans and illegal immigrants. Well, once again, that happened happened at exactly the same time as the Mexican-American population was gaining political power. And now, uh, of course, it's Muslims. And this is happening at the exact same time that Muslims are trying to gain political power, Um, you know, to the point where I think for the first time you had uh, Keith Ellison... Uh, you know, being elected, um, and I think you have somebody else in Minnesota now, um, Ilhan Omar, I think, who's, who's there as well. Really, you only have like two or three people. Uh, but that represents a change from zero and, and therefore a threat to the establishment, or at least you know, vested interests that are used to getting a portion of the pie that they would now have to get less of if they wanted to share it with another, a new group, a new vested interest. So, in order to so you can see how these all these groups are dehumanized in the same way uh, that, that in the same process that occurs on the national level, and and part of that it reminds me of, of a journalist in San Francisco called Warren Hinkle, and uh, he said that listen you know I, I would get the police blotter the, the list of all the crimes and we knew that we would be focusing and publishing the ones that you know that included black against white crime because that's what got the, the, the public's attention. If you had a situation where, where it was black-on-black crime, uh, it just didn't get enough you know, interest from the public. And the reason, of course, is, once again, that dehumanization process that I just talked about. Um, and, if, and, of course, Warren Hinkle, who was actually quite progressive, he exposed, uh, he was against the Vietnam War, he exposed CIA recruitment uh, practices on college campuses, um, and so on. And, and actually, you know, he was very progressive and he also loved speaking with police officers. He would hang out in only in bars where uh, police officers would frequent. And so he would get this police blot- blotter and then he would basically he would know that, you know, it's a situation where I would have to report something that would be 
uh, not conducive to racial harmony uh, within the United States, and, and, and in fact might even be uh, you know, highlighting an instance that is an outlier, because it probably is the case that because of segregation, black-on-black -black crime is far higher than black-on-white crime. And yet, because of the public interest, uh, this liberal journalist uh, had to highlight and, and write about the outlying uh, scenario as opposed to something that might, might have been more accurate to portray. So, you have the same process happening, and once again, that's not a coincidence. It's something that happens because these budgets have to stay the same now. With, with the example with security spending, remember, the, if, if, you know, it's not as if it, it's a cost. Security spending is a cost. Uh, unlike, say, other costs, like, you know, they don't necessarily, it's, it's not as if they produce something in the, at the end of the day. Um, you know, at least not something that, that would be, um, that would recoup your tax investment. It's the foundation for all other economic activity, but it's not something that directly produces tax revenue in the same way as building a, a GM or a car plant that produces a car um, and, you know, you give a tax incentive to General Motors or Ford, um, and then you get that money back in the form of, you know, not only jobs, but sales taxes um, and so on, all of, you know, suppliers and, and, and everything else, um, a whole chain. And so you, you have a position here where the national and the local levels seem to have merged, which once again is problematic because the point of having a police department in each city is that it's, it is supposed to be beholding, beholden to the local community. And that doesn't seem as if that's the case anymore. In some cases, because the budget process has changed, what I just talked about with debt being so cheap, now what's, what's happened is that you know a lot of the police departments that are supposed to be local are now funded by state, uh, by states as opposed to cities or counties. Uh, thereby creating a conflict, a conflict of interest. You know, you now have two masters. Uh, you know, you have a state, and, and in some cases, a national. If you're buying equipment, uh, you know, the military will make a new, uh, a new version of something, of a tank or a Hummer of some sort, a uh, car, um, armored car. Uh, it has to get rid of the old ones. It'll then tell a local police department to apply uh, for a federal, a federal grant, uh, and, and that at that point the uh, you know, they will just simply transfer the old material or the old version to the city uh, and then give for themselves to keep the new one. And so you have these sorts of, you know, now you, now you may have three masters, depending on what's going on there. And once again, you, you have a, a situation where, you know, you have the same process happening and it's not an accident. One of the things that, you know, that I've learned as I've gotten older is that you know as a minority you know I, I and you know I'm, I'm somebody that 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 and I think a lot of immigrants are this way we're sort of opposed to we're sort of naturally scared of people with guns, and that's not based on any sort of rational um, you know argument that's just probably the, the way a lot of us feel because we're outnumbered, uh, we don't have political representation, um, and so it's a situation where you know it's not something where you know if, if there's a fight when we have guns and the other side has guns. Um, you know, we know we're going to lose. And so in some cases with the Black Panthers, that was an excuse to go get as more guns. Um, and, you know, but, but for the most part, you know, and of course, if, if, if you are in a position, you know, obviously if you're Bosnian within, uh, you know, former Yugoslavia, you, you, you do want to be in a position where you have guns um, if you're going to be in a civil war. And I think, but I think a lot of immigrants and minorities, we sort of, we think to ourselves, we're not going to wait until it gets to that point. If it gets to that point, we'll leave. Um, and so that creates a sort of tension between trusting the police uh, and, you know, and also, you know, putting yourself in a position where, you know, you, you are able to help the police with community relations. Uh, because it's a two-way street. A lot of crimes are solved because, you know, the community trusts the police and gives information. Crimes are solved based on information. Um, and even if you have a security camera, it doesn't always, you know, give you enough data to, to make a direct connection in, a, in any sort of database. And so the idea really is that, you know, you have this tension between the immigrant community and a minority community and the police. And part of that tension is, is irrational, but it's still there. Um, and how do we overcome that? You know, liberals and progressives, including myself, we don't really have an answer to that. Um, and so that's part of the problem, and that's something that has to be worked on. And, and, and you know, that, that's one of the reasons that liberals have failed, because historically, 
you know, there are many examples of the police protecting minorities, um, you know, that are the subject of mobs, but not, but whereas when the military shows up, uh, for the most part, they're there to take you to a camp or to a ghetto. But in places like Iowa, you have, a, you know, it was the police that stopped uh, the locals from uh, attacking a city that was a filled with pacifists. There was a military draft in the United, in the United States. And the way it worked is you wanted to spread the burden, you know, equally across the entire nation. You didn't want one city in San Francisco getting, like, San Francisco getting, you know, a lot, a tremendous percentage, uh, you know, a higher percentage of draftees than somebody in Iowa. And so what ha what happened was, uh, you know, if you were a pacifist if you were and a conscientious a CO, an objector, uh, you were exempt from the draft. And as a result of that, numerically, whoever was left in that town had a higher chance of having their sons go to war and, of course, possibly dying. That created a backlash. And the only thing that stopped this city of pacifists, this town, from being burned down, um, it's now filled with Mennonites and, and Amish, um, it, it was police officers. They were there. They protected that, that city, that small town. They protected that minority. Um, and that's one of the greatest success stories in the United States, and you know that, that it, it's that's you know something that would have never happened without the police. Now, us, that's not an isolated incident. You have so many cases like this where it was a police that protected Muhammad Ali. Uh, you know, without the police and local lawyers in in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, there would be no Muhammad Ali uh, at all. And it was a police that, of course, a police officer that, of course, introduced a young Cassius Clay to the boxing gym. And that boxing gym was funded as part of the police activity. Uh, so the police, of course, have always been involved in building communities around them. And quite, quite frankly, those are two examples, but quite frankly, you, you have to be, you cannot really have a society uh, where the minorities feel protected unless you have honest police officers um, that care about the community that they're in. And the question is, how do we get that? And why have we moved so far away from that? I've, I've identified one reason for that, is that, that irrational fear uh, that immigrants and minorities typically have um, you know, with respect to police officers. But part of that is based on the idea that police departments in the United States have become unaccountable to the public. And again, part of that isn't just the way the budgets have been have changed, uh, but also because in, in dis disciplinary hearings, a lot of times you have a national union that sends out a lawyer, uh, or the pace for the lawyer. Uh, you have a lot of interplay between national unions and local unions. So once again, creating a you know, conflict, uh, creating, creating a wedge between the local nature of a police department um, and, the, and the national influences uh, or state influences. So the, some of the fear that minorities have is, of course, justified, especially if you're African-American. Um, and, you know, at the same time, you know, some of it's irrational and, and some of it's rational. Some of it, some of it is, is, of course, rational. Um, and part of that has to do with the fact that lawyers and liberals have failed um, in terms of, of boosting accountability within police departments and transparency. It's actually gone the other way. Um, to get information, you know, for, you can't really access a police officer's personnel uh, file to see any complaints. Uh, there are several, so, you know, you don't really know if the person that's in front of you um, has been disciplined. Uh, it's very difficult to get that get to get that kind of kind of information because transparency has gone the other way with respect to police activities. In part because the vice department within the police departments, the ones that handle uh, the prostitution, drugs, and so on, they've expanded. They also infiltrate the gangs. That is that group, you know, if you think about police departments, you can actually look at the the honest police officers and the, and the detectives and so on. You know, they're on the conventional side of policing. But then you've got this, these vice guys, the guys that work in vice, uh, that, that are in many cases criminals with badges because they have to infiltrate these organizations and in some cases are recruited, uh, you know, to, to go into these organizations um, from the jail system. In the same way that hackers, uh, if they commit a, a cybercrime, are recruited by national agencies uh, in, in the sense that they're given a choice. You know, you can go to jail or you can join us, the NSA. Uh, and they, you know, typically that's one way to, it's, it's, it's again, once again, a, a tactic that's used in the national and the local systems. And so, you know, you've got this situation where, you know, the lawyers have not promoted transparency and, and integrity.
And, and that's one of the other things that we have to fix is how do we fix that issue? Um, and I'm not, once again, I'm, I, I'm not sure I, I have the answer. But that is something that absolutely has to be fixed in order for, you know, in order for society, not just in the U.S., but all, all over the world to, to at least have a fighting chance at not slipping um, into the same, essentially regressing into the same issues uh, that we were, that we were supposed to solve in the 1950s and the 1960s. So, ultimately, you know, if if you have a situation where, you know, you've given up on reform, where reform has become impossible, you know, dec- you know, decay becomes inevitable. So, if 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 you make reform impossible, decay is an, is inevitable, and that's where we are right now. And, you know, that's something that the liberals are, again, you know, it just they're just not fixing it. Um, independent auditing groups, you know, each, each city will have a, an IA department. Uh, in almost every case now, the, if they issue a report to the city council, it is an, in a purely advisory fashion. They're not able to compel anything. They're not able to compel reforms. So it is true that minorities do not trust the police um, and, but part of that fear and mistrust is rational. It's based on uh, the just sort of this national and local movement by different groups to insulate police officers from responsibility, in part because a large portion of police departments have to infiltrate or running secret operations where they have to infiltrate different groups. Now, one response to that would be legalization and regulation of a lot of these activities in order to reduce this segment within the police department that handles vice and to try to shift power back to the, you know, the other side, the conventional policing. Um, and that's, that's starting to happen a little bit, um, but not enough. You know, I, I don't see vice, remember, remember budgets keep going up. Uh, I don't see vice budgets going down anywhere. So this is sort of just, you know, sort of, which is just a conversation I wanted to have. Um, you know, it's another conversation where I don't have the answers. Uh, but at least if we ask the right questions, we can try to get there. Because at least now we can look at these things and see things in context. Because without context, you end up in a situation where someone like Tony Blair, um, he, he was a prom- former prime minister of the UK, made a comment that if we the liberals are focused on things like transgender rights and the conservatives are focused on things like I- illegal immigration, we're going to lose. A statement like that, that implies that the rights of a transgendered person are somehow l- less deserving of attention than another uh, vulnerable group within society, uh, namely an immigrant. Um, a statement like that tells you how the liberal movement has failed, the progressive movement has failed, because what what's happened is, once again, we've accepted this, this casual de- dehumanization of a minority. And what we should be doing is, you know, we should be able to t- trace that um, whatever that minority is, and trace it back to this entire dehumanization process, where you know yesterday uh, it was African Americans being singled out, then it was Mexican Americans, and all of this is tied tied to political power, the gaining of political power, the fear uh, of of groups having to share revenue with new groups, with new entrants, new vested interests. Once we see it in that context, we can try to defang this this clearly consistent. Um, sort of movement that allows us to dehumanize people that are supposed to be neighbors. And if, if we don't know, and, and that's where we are now, and so that has to be one of the solutions, is trying to figure out how to connect that person that seems so different from us and so far away from us, and try to connect that person within the spectrum that shows you that you know the only way you can have an either-or scenario, like Tony Blair pointed out, um, is if you are already caught up, like Madeleine Albright realized she was, in this dehumanization process. Because if the liberals are doing their job, that person who seems so different from the rest of us is actually not, you know, is actually just another person in that long chain of, you know, groups that, that have been singled out in, in order to maintain this fear based economy and the increase in security spending. Once we see it in that context, the next step has to be to strengthen police departments, conventional policing, um, and then also try to build bridges where the police departments increase integrity and accountability 
And, you know, right now, if a police officer is, is, is fired, it's quite likely, you know, for misconduct, it's quite likely that the, the national union system will find an, another police department for that person to go into or, pri- or to go into a private security company. You know, there has to be, it's a two-way street. And right now, it's a situation where it, this issue has to be fixed in order for a country, country not just in the United States, but all over the world, um, in order for people to have trust in their institutions. So that's what I wanted to say today, and I, um, I hope I've, it's been a little bit beneficial in trying to contextualize, contextualize uh, the issues.